I'd like to welcome everyone to the Wednesday night uh, services of Spring for Christ. And I'm privileged to be able to speak to you tonight. What I would like uh, for us to consider is a question I'm sure that many of you have asked from time to time. That is, why do the righteous suffer? Now, if you haven't thought of, thought of it, I'm sure you have. It's certainly one that atheists and agnostics have posed as an objection to the existence of a, a loving God who cares for his children. And their smug inquisition, uh, which they believe to be unassailable, they assume that which cannot be proved. Well, you know, despite their cynicism, we just go ahead and prove why a loving God allows any suffering at all. Why are there wars and atrocities that result in horrific uh, suffering? Why are there natural disasters that overwhelm the unsuspecting in, in almost a random manner? Before we can address the narrow question, why do the righteous suffer? We must first address the much broader question why is there suffering at all, regardless of uh, who it may, may affect? But first, I uh, want to emphasize that, that uh, suffering for anyone, for any reason, is not pleasurable in any respect. It can be physical or emotional, but it is painful. That's why it's called suffering. It may be caused by one's own actions or those of others or by no one. There may be, may be lessons to be learned or no lessons readily, readily uh, ascertainable. But it still must be painfully endured. Only the uh, masochists or the sadists could in their twisted minds think that their suffering or someone else's, it's pleasurable. Well, let, let's uh, return to our theme. Uh, why do the righteous suffer? Or why is there suffering at all? We read in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse uh, 12, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. And the premise stated is that uh, sin entered the world through one man. That one man was Adam. It is important, therefore, to look at Adam and how it is that his sin predetermined that humankind would thereafter suffer in some respect. In Genesis, the second chapter, verses 15 through 17, God commanded Adam, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. He only had one command. For in that, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, previously, it's recorded that the Lord uh, planted, Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the uh, man who, who he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. evil. That's in Genesis 2nd chapter, verses 8 and 9. And from these uh, few passages, we know that God created a paradise at the place of perfection in which his uh, new creation mankind was placed. It was a place of perfection because there was no sin there, nor could it exist there and remain as it was created. If sin did exist there, then it was not a place of perfection. The two trees specifically mentioned were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
we know from the divine record that these trees produce fruit appealing to the palate and the sight. Likely there were some physical characteristics that allowed uh, Adam to discern the difference between the two trees, or perhaps it was just location. I doubt that the inherent qualities of the fruit of either tree in or of itself accounted for the attributes associated with it. I suspect that one gave life and the other the not in good and evil only because invested those attributes in the fruit of those trees. God said that of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat one command and one consequence. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, physical death, death was not immediate. But spiritual death was. Their sin had separated them from God. It was not the fruit itself that caused, that caused their spiritual death and their eventual physical death, but their disobedience. Since Eden was a place of perfection, they could not continue to abide there. They were now tainted by sin, and sin cannot be allowed to coexist with perfection. In Genesis, Genesis, the third chapter, verses 22 and 24, we read of a conversation in which the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand to take also a tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to kill the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Upon his expulsion, man no longer had access to the tree of life. According to this passage, the tree of life would have allowed man to live forever. And this likely means physical life since the spirit has everlasting existence. Once expelled, man began to die physically. Now how physical death was to come upon each individual is not specifically mentioned. However, from the divine record, we see many ways in which physical death can come, none of which is particularly appealing. We should keep in mind that we are descendants of Adam. Every physical attribute he possessed so do we, Bailey Buttons accepted, of course. Like Adam, we possess free will, freedom to choose, to sin, or to obey God. It matters not whether an individual ever sins, subjecting him to spiritual death, as a descendant of Adam has, having the same physical attributes. That same individual, sinless though he may be, will suffer physical death, unless the Lord comes first. The causes of death would be no different than the causes uh, described in Holy Writ for any person, infant, or the age. This was the free will choice of Adam that affects us to this day. Is there an example of lineal descendants suffering through no fault of their own? Well, yes. In Exodus 20th chapter, verse 5, we read, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Therefore, we die physically because of Adam's sin. We die spiritually because of our own. Sin can cause others to suffer or to die physically, who are not guilty of that sin at all. However, we suffer spiritual death because of our own sin. While we may recognize how sin entered the world uh, with suffering as a result, uh, therefore we can identify Satan as a source of all suffering, 
This does not prevent others from assigning certain other causes to the suffering of the righteous. It is not necessarily the case that suffering is a result of, of or a punishment for one's own sin, although it may be. Nevertheless, for the longest of times, the common view of suffering was that it resulted from the guilt of the sufferer, that is, the sufferer had incurred God's wrath by transgressing his law and was, therefore, being punished by some sort of physical or emotional suffering. We recall that Job's so-called comforters held this view. In Job 4th chapter, verses 7 through 9, Eliphaz said this, among other things, to Job. Remember now, whoever punished being innocent? Or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the blast of God they perish and by the breath of his anger they are consumed. But Job in his pleadings to God said, you know that I am not wicked, Job 10th chapter verse 7. Furthermore, in one of his responses to his comforters, he wondered why it was that the wicked prosper if his comforters were right. That's in the 21st chapter of Job. The Lord set the matter right when he responded to Eliphaz, as recorded in Job 42, verse 7. The Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my wrath has aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken to me what is right, as my ser ser servant Job has. Another example is found in the... Uh, Gospel of John, verses one, uh, 9, verses 1 through 3, in respect to the born, uh, man born blind. It reads, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked, asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And remember, he born born blind, innocent, you know, born blind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now keep in mind, the man was born blind, and he was therefore untainted by sin. Then Jesus proceeded to heal the man born blind. Well, another example found in Luke 13, chapter verses 1 through 5. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. For those 18 on whom the power in Siloam failed and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Again, these examples do not say that an individual will not experience suffering as a direct result of that individual's, individual's own sin. But they do say that the innocent, as well as the sinner, may suffer as a result of the sin of the sinner. We cannot min minimize or emphasize enough the effects of the sin of Adam had on this physical world. Adam was put in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it, so some form of work was necessary. After Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, God said to Adam, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I command you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, and for dust you are, dust you shall return. That's in the, in the third chapter of Genesis, 
verses 7 through 19. Well, after sin came into the world and Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, work was still required, but qualitatively it was much different. In response to those who allege that God causes the righteous to suffer, I again refer to the accounts of the suffering of Job. There we see that it was the devil that afflicted Job, not God. Also in 2 Corinthians 12, chapter verse 7, God, uh, Paul made a revealing statement regarding the source of his thorn in the flesh. He said, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, bless me, lest I be exalted above measure, and kept him humble. Furthermore, in Luke, the 13th chapter, verses 11 through 16, uh, Jesus revealed that it was Satan that had bound the woman who had a spirit of, of infirmity for 18 years. You can read that, that passage on your own. <clears throat> From what we have considered so far, what may be concluded about the sources of the suffering of the righteous? First, we can say that God is not the source of suffering. But you may ask, uh, didn't God punish Israel and Judah by sending them off into captivity? God punishes sin. Punishment results in suffering of some sort. But God does not cause one to sin. That is a free will choice and therefore sin is a source of suffering of the one punished. It may be the case, and almost always is, that the innocent also suffer as a result of the punishment of evil. You may want to consider the case of Daniel and his three friends. Second, we see from the scriptures here and considered a, a personal sin is eliminated as a source of the suffering of the righteous. But at a first point, didn't we just say that God punishes sin and punishment results in suffering? Yes, we did. But here we're considering the suffering of the righteous, those who by definition are not guilty of sin, but suffer nevertheless. They suffer because of punishment of sin, but not necessarily their own sin. Third, ultimately sin is the cause of suffering of the righteous. Indeed, it is the sin of Adam, the curse from the earth, Satan, and evil men who are the sources of the suffering of the righteous. We, as well as Adam, no longer have access to the tree of life. Therefore, we, as lineal descendants of Adam, and having his human nature, are, are subject to suffering and physical death. That is why infants, and even before they become infants, that completely innocent of sin can die because of the sin of Adam there progenitor. But didn't Peter write in 1 Peter 4.19, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. The skeptic will say if God is all powerful, he would eliminate the suffering of the righteous. The righteous suffer, therefore, God is not all powerful. This is an unsound argument because the major premise assumes that which cannot be proved. There was no man more righteous than Jesus. Yet when Peter tried to prevent his being seized by the servants of the high priest, Jesus said, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me, me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Find that in the 26th chapter of Matthew, verses 52 to 54. So God did not cause the suffering of Jesus, but he allowed the suffering of Jesus. The initial uh, question initially posed, why do the righteous suffer, perhaps should be uh, restated to why does God permit the righteous to suffer. Restating the question, of course, does not answer. 
So why does God permit the righteous to suffer? The 145th Psalm, verse 17, says that the Lord is righteous in all his ways. Being righteous is being right. God can do no wrong. God allows or, permit, or permits the righteous, that, that is, those who have done no wrong, to suffer. Therefore, it must be right. Suffering must provide some advantage that the righteous would not have otherwise. In Philippians, the first chapter, verses 21 through 23, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this, this will mean fruit to my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Now, we've read about the life of Paul. He suffered. Uh, terribly for the cause of Christ. So it's, it's not all that surprising that he says that the die is gained since being with Christ offers so much more than, than this life. Although he had a, a desire to depart and be with Christ as the far better option, he did choose life for the flesh because it benefited more than just himself. He did not say that the dying process is pleasant. He further states in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 6 through 8, the following. So we are always confident knowing that while we are home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Again, although the dying process may be painful, there's something glorious missing from life and flesh that is gained by our presence with the Lord. Suffering reminds us of that. The psalmist can say that he has been delivered from death and then say, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. 116th Psalm, verse 15. Indeed, life in the flesh was never intended to be something to be grasped and cherished as if there were nothing beyond it. Moses implored the Lord to teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The 90th Psalm, verse 12. We find in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, that being grieved by various trials, that's suffering, if you will, will prove the genuineness of our faith resulting in praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This passage also indicates that in the expanse of eternity, suffering in this life is only for a little while. It reads in part, you can read uh, all of it yourself, but it reads in part, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, begotten, he begotten us again to living hope, kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. In this you greatly rejoice, through, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is stated in James, the first chapter, verses 2 through 4, that we are to count it all joy when we fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces patience. The writer of Romans says that we are to glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. That's in the fifth chapter of uh, Romans, verses 3 through 5. And in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, we read that Paul was given a thorn in the flesh, and we read that verse uh, just a moment ago, lest he uh, be exalted above measure, that is, uh, he goes beyond a, a measure of humility. And Peter wrote that if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, he, not we or thee, he will exalt us in due time. That's in 1 Peter 
5th chapter, verse 6. As, as recorded in 1 Peter, the 2nd chapter, verses 18 through 20, Peter instructed servants, and these had to be Christian servants, to be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. So this is commendable if because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Well, what credit is it if, when you're beaten for your fault, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Not only did he address Christian servants, but all Christians, that if we you are reproached for the, uh, the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. That's in the fourth chapter, verse, uh, first, uh, Peter, verse 14. Being reproached involved suffering, but it wasn't necessarily physical suffering, it could be emotional as well. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 6 said, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. You might also look at the Psalms, the 119th Psalm, verse 75, and Proverbs 3, verse 12. Peter, in his first epistle bearing his name, had much to say about suffering. In 1 Peter, the third chapter, verse 8 through 4th chapter, verse 19, we're not going to read all that, but just uh, uh, read parts of it. For who would love life and see good days? Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayers. God cares about his people. Further down, he says, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you're blessed. And in verse uh, chapter 4, it begins there. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. If you suffer uh, on behalf of Christ, sin then no longer has an appeal to you. <clears throat> you know, down to uh, verse 12, chapter 4. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let it, none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. And in verse 18, now if the right if the righteous one is scarcely saved, what will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Or where will the godly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their soul to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. What then is the answer to the survival of suffering? Well, Christ is our example. If he suffered, being righteous, why should we be exempted? In 1 Peter, the second chapter, verses 21 through 23, we read, For to this you were called to Christ, because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. In 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verse 19, 
Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their soul to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Are we willing to entrust our soul to our faithful creator even when we're suffering as a righteous person? Do we have the confidence that Paul had as he wrote in 2 Timothy verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 8 through 12? Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But share with me in, in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us for the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time again. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, and brought life and immortality light through the gospel, to which I was appointed as a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. Can we then place our full trust in him, knowing that he is faithful to keep that which we have committed to him until that great resurrection day? Perhaps we should keep in mind that beautiful and instructive gospel hymn, which says in part, tempted and tried, we're all made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. Father alone will know all about it. Father alone will understand why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Thank you for your kind attention. I hope this has been beneficial to you.